when I used to actually hire new staff for our school or for a district, one of the things that I looked for explicitly was what I call the sponge factor, uh, the ability to learn, the ability to actually grow and develop. Because I know that if you have that ability to grow, uh, you will be better as you go through this experience. And I actually use those um, interview times to actually like challenge some thoughts. Uh, to to kind of push some thinking because my focus was not only on that person being able to grow, but hiring someone that would push my thinking as well because I wanted to get better. I wasn't looking for people that would just do what I said when I was the principal. I was looking for people that would do what's best for kids. And that meant, you know, pushing our thinking. And so really someone who'd like, you know, learn new information would be willing to connect with others to really kind of amplify um, the, their own learning so that we could all be better as a community and their classroom community could be, you know, grow along with them as well. And so that's why I really appreciate this conversation with Matt Rhodes today, because he talks a lot about these ideas. He talked about um, some of the conversations that we have, you know, with new e educators entering the profession. I learned a lot um, from that process and really how do we amplify learning? So I hope you're going to enjoy this conversation. Uh, I really enjoyed connecting with Matt. You can see uh, his, his links to his books, uh, his Twitter, uh, his blog. There's a ton of learning that he shares online. And I think it'll, if you spend time with us today, uh, I, I think it's really going to push your learning. It really helped mine. So welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Crows. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Uh, today, I have a special guest. The name is Matt Rhodes. And Matt and I connected, uh, you know, uh, we've connected in, in early 2020 before all the craziness actually happened. Uh, we've been connected ever since. We've uh, talked a lot on, on Twitter. I've seen a lot of his work. And Matt is currently, uh, I'll say your, your job title, but it's kind of like when you explain it to me, I'm like, I don't, I don't really get it. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, you're an ed tech integrationist and instructional leader, but then you also started describing some of the things that you do. And there's like about 10 million aspects of your job that are very unique. So Matt, first of all, thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast. But if you can just kind of tell people who you are, what you do and how you got there, that'd be a great way to start. For sure. So I work for an adult education consortium, which is essentially like a school district, but for adult education schools um, within North San Diego County called Education and Career Network. Uh, we have five adult schools and then we have a junior college and we range enrollment. It just depends on the time of year um, between about nine to about 15,000, just really depending on um, our enrollment and where that fluctuates. And essentially I go in and I help as an instructional coach, uh, support teachers in their online blended and in-person classrooms um, through coaching cycles, observations, and just uh, meeting and having conversations with them about what do they want to do? How can they support learning through a lot of different types of classes? So um, career technical education, so I could go into a nursing class, uh, in, uh, ESL class, I could go mm -hmm. into a, uh, a coding class, a computer class, I could go into um, a health essentials class. I mean, there's so many different options that I can go into and they're all in these different types of modalities, you know, whether it's online, uh, blended or in person. And then I also provide professional development and I focus really on um, instruction as well as taking uh, the strategies that are research-based and integrating them with the tools that we have access to, um, to, um, you know, amplify learning and put our teachers and students in a position to, um, you know, be successful. And besides that, I work on operations team and I help make decisions and do all the worker bee things within uh, the consortium. Mm -hmm. So I would say essentially it's equivalent yeah, to like a district office role. So yeah, everything, whatever, whatever yeah. you needed that day. Kind exactly. Of. Yeah. It's a lot of different things, but it's really enjoyable. I was in the classroom for a number of years, teaching secondary special education, doing some tech coaching, and then came into the consulting and I just, you know, started writing and, and all that. And that wound up the positions at San Diego State University, uh, where I support teacher candidates and do language program. And then at Concordia mm -hmm. University, Irvine, where I support doctoral students in writing their dissertation. So doing a lot, but I really enjoy it. Super blessed. And I think that um, what I'm really grateful for is I get to see a lot of different strands of education. Right. And I think that gives me good insight as to what's going on, um, especially in Southern California, but also just 
gives me a good snapshot of, you know, possibly some trends around uh, North America. Well, I'm, I'm actually curious when you said that you work with, you know, people like in different sectors of education, right? And I think, you know, a lot of times when I'll do PD days, they'll ask me to separate, like they want to separate like the, the, the kindergarten to like grade seven or something like that. And then, the, you know, grade eight to high school people or whatever, they'll, they'll find some way like, hey, these people do something totally different than these people. I'm like, well, yes and no, right? Like there's a lot of connections between their work, right? And, you know, like then it, it actually creates this misperception like, oh, you have it easy. Because you have the same kids all day. Well, you have it easy because you say you teach the same thing, you know, four times a day. Right. And it's kind of that. But it's but it's actually, you know, like there's there's complexities, there's there's similarities. So when you actually look at working with all those different fields, is there any like common themes that you see uh, between all of them that you, you know, like, hey, no matter what you do, this is part of good teaching? Yeah. So I think that there's a couple elements. So first is it's all about relationship and connections. And then the uh, second element is let's provide opportunities for our students to be active learners. I mean, in classrooms, I mean, we, I see too many students just sitting there passively, um, you know, not really doing much. Right. And I want to change that and provide opportunities for where the learner and the teacher are interacting simultaneously with these active learning strategies. And they can be done within any setting. And it doesn't matter if it's a kindergarten, first grade, or someone that's in a doc program. I mean, you can use, a, I mean, what I love using the most is um, Kagan Cooperative Learning or Project Zero strategies that are thinking routines and implementing them with um, a number of tech tools. And it, it doesn't matter what grade or content mm -hmm. that you're working with, you can take them and incorporate them um, really for anyone. And it can hopefully, um, you know, make them more further engaged and more active learning. And it's more, you know, them, um, you know, doing the work versus the teacher um, being that stage on the stage. So um, that's kind of just a lot of just my thoughts about that. I, you know, we, and I told Matt before that we like, I'll just ask you whatever comes to my mind. And I was like, this is a tough one. And you, you nailed that one. That was good. Like that, the, like the, the relationships and connection really obviously very powerful. Doesn't matter what we teach. But I think the the ability to learn is so crucial in the work that we do in education. And you, you think about that process, no matter if, if you create a, a space where people are dependent upon you for learning. And I think that actually is something that, you know, can be an issue in education sometimes is that uh, like I, I talk about this quite a bit. When I first started teaching, I was a very, very good speaker. Not as a good teacher. Those are two different skill sets, right? And and like the kids could like listen to me. They could like, oh, like Mr. Crows, you're so funny. You're so interesting and all this other stuff. And then I remember actually some of those same kids are like, oh, this teacher, like they're like making us like do stuff and like figure things out. Like we just miss listening to you. And I'm like, and I was like, oh my God, like, the, like I created a mess, right? Because it was like more focused, to, like to be honest with you, and I think this is, I'm proud that I can reflect on this is more focused on me as a teacher than them as a student. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, that's kind of, I mean, I'm in the opposite wheelhouse is that I'm not, I don't think I, I can really improve in my speaking ability, but I have my students really focused on just being too, doing too much stuff. So. Right. Yeah. Well, that's good. You know, like, that's good. Like, I think, I think, you know, I, like I said, I, I think a lot of times people, and I think a lot of times teachers are like, well, I should be able to speak. I'm like, it is a different skill set. It's not teaching. They're like, they, they are, they are like, there's obviously similarities, but there's like, there's differences in, in what those, those things are uh, as well. And, and, you know, you kind of talked about this idea of amplifying learning. And I know uh, I'm looking at uh, this, uh, your, your website here. And I know that it's not just a book, it's a series of books. So can you just tell us about um, this series, what it is? Um, and we'll, we'll link down below. Um, so if you want to learn more about it, you can, but like, tell us what, what, when you talk about amplifying learning, what, what is that about? So essentially it's a global collaborative where we've taken educators from around the world within K 16, um, settings and having them talk about what are the strategies that are working with you in a variety of different classroom settings, whether that's online in person or blended and essentially them you know, providing the research-based strategies and their experiences, um, using them with students and using it as a guide to help teachers and using it as a, uh, from teachers across the world. And me and my co-author, um, 
Becky Lim go in and provide our commentary and provide additional suggestions throughout. And we cover um, things from engagement, collaboration, assessment to computer science, robotics, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, special education. Um, so a variety of different topics and each of the book is comprised within different themes. And the first one is amplifying instructional design, which is engagement, collaboration and assessment and feedback. So, okay. So I actually, I'm looking at this. So uh, is there, is there four books? Um, yeah, there's four books that I'm looking at. Is that correct? There's four books. So, okay. So tell me like really briefly amplifying authentic learning. Give me like the, the, so essentially that's the second book and you're focused uh, on reading, writing and mathematics. And how can we do that authentically by making it more student centered? So right. we talk about throughout the book strategies from teachers across um, their various places that they're located at, you know, how can we make this more student centered, but also what are strategies or research base that can make this happen with a variety of different tech tools. Okay. And then the third one is amplifying student inquiry. And so tell us, give us a little synopsis of that one. So we're using different content like robotics and computer science and STEAM as a way to create lessons that um, provide students opportunities to really question and think about, um, you know, variety of different topics and productive struggle um, relating to um, creating with robots or writing code for the robots, Mm -hmm. or for example, um, for STEAM, putting it all together in, in, a, in, a, in a lesson sequence. So, I mean, it's, um, so that one's really interesting. I really love that book, by the way, because I don't think it's talked about uh, enough because okay. I think that's where classrooms should go. This is my test to see if you actually wrote these books, right? So I'm like seeing if, <laughs> right, like connections. So the last one, amplifying di- diverse learning needs. Tell us about that one. So essentially it's taking the example of multilingual learners or neurodivergent students and mm-hmm. essentially thinking about what are research-based strategies that can work you know, effectively for them and taking experiences from teachers who are actually working with these students on a daily basis and providing suggestions relating to, you know, how can we amplify their learning within online, in-person, and, and blended um uh, blood and settings and it's from teachers across the world so not only just the united states focusing right. on our our perspective but we have two authors from india that talk about what special education looks like in india and then we have for example um a teacher from morocco that talks about um teaching students english in morocco right so using those experiences as you know a different perspective and putting different spin on it versus what we traditionally hear about um, when we think about that North American or, you know, European lens. You, you like, so your job is like really all over the place. You've written like a zillion books. So like, what do you, do you, do you do? Any, what else do you do? Like, do you get duo for fun? Like, how, like I'm like, oh, saying, uh, yeah. So I, I, I love, I love working out. I love basketball. Uh, I played college basketball. Did you play college uh, basketball? Yeah I, played, yeah. I played against Kawhi Leonard in high school, same all-star game. He dunked on no, me a number of times. No, you didn't. Yeah, no. he has. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you see Kawhi behind me, right? You see that, right? That's I Kawhi do. That's the one he won with the title of the Raptors. Oh yeah. That's yeah, true. I forget. That, yeah. Oh, no, don't worry. I'll bring it up every chance I get. Right. So, right. Got a little. Yeah. I, I'm a big. I'm a big Kawhi fan. So uh, we 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 love him. We, he's like he's like basically you know like how like athletes get like a key to the city when they do something really good. He basically has a key to the country. It's like <laughs> I can only like, imagine, right? Oh yeah. He's like he like changed the the view of basketball in Canada. So uh, I could totally go on a basketball rant. So I'm gonna like get away from that right away. Um, one of the one of the things that um, I'm really curious about, uh, and it's kind of like you know probably based in like when we first met in the work that you actually do. How do you see technology? It, it, do you think it's viewed differently since 2020? Like like some of the things, that, the perceptions of it when we first met versus today, and is it maybe an, in a negative? Is it in a positive? Like, how is, is it shifted where it's just a thing? It's just like, we don't even think about it anymore. Like, how, how do you see, has that changed? Oh, man, that's a, that's a loaded question, George, because I think it just depends on where you go and the culture it is at that school or district. Right. And whether it's, uh, it could be rural. Uh, I think rural definitely has a very different viewpoint than right. it does more urban and suburban, uh, just because of, you know, equity in regards to, just the ability to have the devices and infrastructure and access. But 
I mean, I think that a lot of places, um, due to high levels of burnout, um, there's been a snapback, at least this school year, because I think this past year, 2021, 22 school year has been the hardest school year, I think, in 100 years. And um, I think that places where you have cultures where it is more focused on following in line, as well as um, just higher levels of stress, um, and maybe just there wasn't that um, capacity in general in the first place. I think those are the places where that snap back, where technology become much less focused. Um, I know districts where they took away all the devices. I mean, um, like like this past year. Yeah, they took away every uh-huh. device um, because they said that they're old. But I don't think that's the true story. Right. You're right. Um, right. But um, I've seen that happen, and then um, but I've also seen the bright spot is that I've seen districts really. Um, you know, want to use technology and they've kind of transformed. I mean, they've taken, you know, a lot of places didn't have an LMS and now they're using an LMS as their central hub for everything and providing instruction from that LMS as that airport for that 24 seven instruction, which is, you know, providing those resources and supports there, you know, you're providing more equitable models for students as long as they have the ability to um, access it. So I think it's in pockets. I think, I think it just depends on where you go. And, and you go to more schools and districts than I do, but I think it's in pockets where you see um, more of that use versus less of the use. I don't think there's an overall trend. Um, I do think it's become more embedded overall, but I think that it just really depends on where you go. So like what you, what you I, you know, when, when I'm listening to you and thinking about this, I think a lot of times we, we point to like systems and we point to technology and and really it's about people like at the end of the day it's about people and that's what it is right like i always this is the thing right you say this like people oh the system like well the system is made up of people the system is not this like fictitious you know or this uh thing that just hovers above us (laughs) it is actually made up of people and it's made up of decisions right so when you're talking about like those different cultures uh you know school cultures uh in these spaces uh, it always like, how, how are we getting to that leadership? And I always like give the example of like, I, I, I actually got my teachers to hate technology more, even though I had a focus on it when I was the first principal, because uh, we talked about on the other podcast, I was like showing them tool after tool, after tool, after tool. And they're like, like, dude, slow down. Like, like just show us one thing and give us some time to play. Right. Like let us figure some of this stuff out. And I think a lot of that, you know, um, there is kind of this need at obviously at the beginning when people are going to remote learning spaces, you know, whether they wanted to or not, they were, they like had to, cause it was the only way they actually had access. And then it started like, Oh, well, now you have this and now you have this and now you have this. And I've like actually um, spoke at like some virtual conferences. And what's interesting is that, you know, companies see the opportunity to like, Hey, we're going to create this space over top of zoom. That's like an <laughs> over top of thing because and they like sell something. It's like, let's, can we just like, just use the zoom? Like, can we just use that space? Because there's always these things that we can add on and stuff like that too. And like, we just continuously add on. And at the end of the day, somebody has got to like, kind of just say, Hey, like, like can we, we need to slow down. Like let's, let's focus. And then you talked about, like I said, um, and I talked about this interviewer's mindset, the idea of less is more. Let's focus on what we do really well. And like, let's go there. And the, like the concern for me when I hear that, hey, some schools are pulling stuff away. That's not the system. That's people making that decision who are actually pulling that stuff away. And I've, ne- I've never, ever heard a school said, you know what? Like we've had some issues with pen and paper. So we started pulling that away <laughs> from every single student. No one's yeah. ever said that. But we do that with technology. And so, yeah, like there's issues. I get that. But I've also watched kids stab each other with pens and we don't mass pull them away. So you're taking away, like when you talk about the notion of equity and then you say, we're going to mass pull away uh, technology from kids, you are actually not honoring some kids that need that access. If if that makes, uh, am I off here or like? No, I I agree with you. I mean, I think it's kind of like you've opened Pandora's box and once you start taking it away, I mean, it's, I mean, you're not being equitable because you are taking away something they may not already had. Right. And, may, and maybe like, and like I'm not, I, I, I always say this, if you take away paper and pen for a child that thrives with it, I'd have a huge problem with it as I would if you took away a, a, a mobile device, right? Whatever the kid needs yeah. to see, that's where you start. 
So the other question I got to ask you is you, you, you do a lot of work with new teacher, new teachers entering the profession. Is that yes. correct? So, okay. So <laughs> like, uh, maybe I don't even know if I want to ask this question or like, are they all freaked out? Like, are they all like, Oh, yikes. I don't, <laughs> do I want to go into this? Like what's, do you see a difference now of people entering the profession than you would maybe a couple of years ago? Like what's the the perception as, as they enter the space? Because like you said, 2021 is like, I, I have, the majority of people I've talked to over the last year said, this is like the hardest year ever. And I don't think that's a, you know, like it's true, but I don't think people are like, oh, I can't wait to get into this profession. That's way harder than it was yeah. even when I first started, you know, going to college for it. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I feel like it's something that they don't want to talk about a whole lot, but I right. think that it comes out in a little bit of tidbits. So I think for one example is that, um, each of the student teachers that I'm seeing right now in my supervision and coaching is that they're extremely passionate for building relationships with kids. Right. And they are less focused on, I think, more of the instructional pieces, but being there for kids and building relationships, which I have told them is, is that everything else can come next. Just build relationships right. with kids. But at the same time, I tell them it's that you got to go to places, you got to be really strategic. It's a new educator nowadays. You got to be really strategic in where you want to go, what do you want to do, and create habits that you know for yourself could be sustainable, creating those right. personal boundaries. Like, for example, I always tell them, you know, fitness, like eat healthy, get enough sleep, right. um, possibly, I mean, talk to someone that's outside of your circle right. or, you know, it's, I, I think you have to have those supports in place. And to be honest, not everyone has those opportunities. And I, I, I just think that you have to have that support infrastructure around you to and be strategic about where you want to go for you to be successful. And um, without that, then it's going to be um, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And um, like I told the teachers last night in our session about digital portfolios and you know, the hiring process is that you have the choice to pick, ask questions, look at, you know, I, I told them to ask about the master schedule. The master schedule is a bigger determinant of culture, I think, than most mm -hmm. of the items that you could ask someone. Look at how much prep time you have. Do they right. have PLCs? What, you know, those are really important questions. And I think that, you know, a lot of the teachers nowadays, if you're a teacher candidate right now, you should be the one interviewing the districts interview the schools that's a, that's actually like i'm interested about that and i don't know if that's a the, the, in your in in uh like southern california right so yeah. like <laughs> when i first started teaching <laughs> you took whatever job you can get I, I know right so i don't know like so i don't know if that's you know i know like you hear stuff about like the great resignation and like that's not like if you if you think that's just only happening in education then you're in a bubble right? Like it's happening in basically all professions. Uh, but the, the reality of that is like, like it, it, you think it's shifted that much where teachers actually, you know, coming into the profession have way more choice over the jobs that they take than when, when I first started. Oh, I think so. If you have specialized credential, these students have dual language, they can do Spanish oh, okay. and English, then also special education. I think people that are going in is with special education. I mean, these are the two groups. You have the leverage, ask the questions because those are what are needed right. and go somewhere that best suits you. And I think that's just for every teacher. I think that mm -hmm. um, depending on where you go, I mean, it depends. San Diego is a competitive market versus, for example, San Bernardino, California or Visalia right. or Sacramento. Right. But I mean, there's I mean, there's places where I know that they'll interview and they'll give you the job the, the next hour. So, I mean, right it's being strategic and where do you want to end up? And do you want to be places where you know that you have an opportunity that they can sustain you and you have a great opportunity to, you know, grow and build relationships with the kids as well as the community there. So the, 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 and I appreciate that you're talking about like really kind of interviewing the district and, and how important that is as people are welcome into the profession. I think the other part of it too, like, the the district will the district will tell you a lot about when you're leaving it too. Yeah, well, and you can you can actually be. Uh, I someone said this that, um, and it wasn't in education, but it, it's so true that more people make decisions about the district or the area that they work in 
based not only not on the first three months, but on their last three months. And that's where they start doing that. Like what happens when they know you're leaving? How do they treat you? Mm-hmm. How do they connect with you? Right. And there is that there is that disconnect where people are like being treated extremely poorly. And you and, you know, th- again, this is people, not systems. This is yeah. people like leading and creating systems. But the reality of this is you think, oh, well, this person is leaving. So like, what do I care how they feel when they're going? Well, that person's leaving and then they're going to talk to all their teacher friends and say how much your your district sucks and how they yeah. treated you poorly, as opposed to like, make sure that when people are walking out that they are like, I, like, I think the best thing you can do as a district is make people like, like have like, you know, like regrets they're leaving because they just appreciate it so mm-hmm. much. Not like, oh, you're going to regret it. But like, but that idea is like, wow, like this is a place that I felt really cared for. And yes. this is a very tough decision because, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be feel this way because then you'll become, even in your absence, you'll become an advocate exactly. for that place. And I think that that's lost exactly. on a lot of people too, right? Yeah, I think that's a huge piece of the puzzle there. And, um, you know, if you empower someone to grow and learn and, you know, they're going to help your organization, your district, and then right. they're going to say great things about you in their right. next in their next stage. And that could, you know, be great for you. That could be great for recruiting people into your right. into your district and school. And you, you want to be that and you want to have people have a good taste in their mouth when they leave. Word of, word of mouth is more true than social media. I agree. That's 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 one that's one thing I'll 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 get people to really think about this is that because word of mouth I'm having like conversations that aren't projected to everybody. So it tells you whereas like when I'm saying stuff, right? Uh you know, like a lot of people have these conversations. Uh, I I wanted to uh, I I pulled out actually is is funny because I, you know, I asked you to be on the podcast and then uh your your tweet popped up in my home line or in my home page like right before and I like bookmark it I'm like oh I'm totally talking about this. So you wrote this uh, on April 3rd uh, on Tuesday I'm presenting to my teacher candidates a session on getting hired, building their own brand and navigating professional learning. I'll be discussing Twitter, digital portfolios, resumes, interviews, leveraging your network for PD. Just tell me a little bit about that tweet and some of the stuff that you talked about. Yeah, so um, the, we actually spoke with them last night and had a nice um, presentation with them and talked to them about all these facets. And um, a lot of people um, in that thread just provided a lot of tidbits of information that were really beneficial. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I told my students. I pulled up the tweet um, when I was presenting and I said, like, hey, guys, like this is how you could do some great professional learning especially if you cultivate your uh, network and you can get a lot of great suggestions and ideas that you can curate. And a lot of those things I talked about um, that a a number of people mentioned in that thread and that helped make my presentation better and um, just try to use that as an example and just really help me prepare. Well, so like, like I, I think about this when I was looking at this, I thought about it first as, um, you know, someone who obviously does a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, but I also thought about from the hiring perspective. So when I, when we used to hire, um, you know, for a school, we would look at resumes, right. And we would look at your resume, kind of go through it. And we, we would get like, I'm telling you at this time, <laughs> this was like kind of shocked. Like we would get like 500 applications wow. for like a grade two position. Right. So I would actually look through all of them. And then once I get to like my, basically, here's my like 10 considerations I'm going to interview for you. That's when I start Googling you. That's when I start looking you up and seeing what you're doing. And, and people like thought like that, like you, you don't necessarily do that. But I also like, here's the reality. If you don't like something saying this is, doesn't make it any less true. Is that, do you know who, who's going to Google you? If I hire you all the community, every parent, right? So it's like me doing my due diligence, like kind of going through that process and going, and uh, you kind of you kind of see that, right? And so one of one of the uh, you know so be cognizant of what you're putting out there. But one of the things that I, I think still to this day, in we're recording this in April of 2022, a lot of school districts don't like Google candidates, don't care about this stuff. But I always say to people to leverage it. So for example, if I was to like hand in a resume for a job today, I would say on the very first line of that resume for full portfolio, please go to georgecrows.ca. So I'm like leading you to this space. Like there is going to be so much more than what I could provide in this paper resume that you've asked me to give you. 
or, you know, but like just all you do is click this one link and like now you can just do QR code, blah, blah, blah. I think it, I think it looks nicer. I know the QR code is like, you know, easy, but I think it's just like, Hey, like this is professional. You don't want the like uh Lincoln park lover 72 at, you know, hotmail.com uh, link. You want something that like, looks a little bit professional. Um, do you, do you see like, as you see new teachers coming in, is this, is this just what they do? Or are they coaxed to do it? Do they do they go through the cleanup of their social media? Like, what do you? How do you see people utilizing this? Yeah, so I told them to be uh, very explicit, like you said, you know, because a person's story can't be summed up in a resume. Right. But if you use a digital portfolio and you have a blog and you provide a lot of different uh, a video on your page as well, when someone's choosing you or someone's mm. going through the process of vetting and doing their due diligence, you get to get to know the person's story. Right. know a little bit about who they are. I mean, versus just the summed up parts and pieces that you learn within an interview or um, just looking at the candidate themselves on the piece of paper. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, and part of saying it's the university, the, the goal is um, for the students by the end of their program to develop this digital portfolio and embed it within their resume um, for schools to view. Yeah, so we actually, uh, with Katie Novak and I, we we teach um, uh, 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 a course, or a, it's like a certificated course. It's a master's program with uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I do the first part, she does the second part, but we make them maintain a portfolio the entire time, and all their assignments have to be provided through this mm-hmm. portfolio. And part of the reason that, and, and like, do they do they have to be? No, but it's very highly encouraged because many of the people that are actually in that course are, you know, in education and they're applying for, you know, different positions eventually. And that's, that's part of the reason they're actually taking the class. And so what I'm trying to do is not only get them to like learn stuff in the class, but actually prepare their thinking and learning so that when they do apply, it's not like here, Hey, you should do all this stuff in the class and you should do a portfolio. It's like, Hey, a lot of the stuff that you're sharing. And I actually tell them, Hey, tie it to the, Tie what we're talking about in this class to the current work that you're doing and, and don't do don't do two separate things because this is going to be so beneficial to you when you do apply for that job. And I just didn't want it to be like a another thing, but just part of like mm-hmm. if you're if they're putting their ideas together, but it also gives them an opportunity to like you don't know, share it because it's like a lot of people think portfolio, they think uh, just WordPress or, you know, and just writing as opposed to, hey, use like use video, use some audio. It gives different, and then then you actually have a better understanding of it if you ever wanted to implement this with students. 100%. But they use it like they create it their entire time, and many of the people that I worked with actually uh, continue to update it after the class, which which is the hope, right? So I think there's there's something really powerful about that. Um, if you if you are looking, um, if you're looking at you know some if you're googling people with some of the portfolio, what's something that you would look for um, that that helps them tell a story like what would like what's some like out of all those things what is something that like what's the big thing that you think people should focus on i think they should focus on the person's development and like how do they develop over time right i mean for example if you look at my uh blog over the last three years i i talk predominantly about data literacy which is what i did my doctoral uh, program in and then i you know kind of taken what i've learned from and teaching and using it to talk about instruction, instructional strategies, coaching, um, and all those types of things, seeing that person's evolution and seeing how they reflect in that evolution. And I think that that shows that the person is constantly learning. And I think that if you can see that evident within their profile, um, that is, that's extremely important because that person's going to be bendable and able to, you know, learn things within that new role or whatever they're doing. Um, versus someone that's just talking about the same thing over and over again. Right. And that actually, it's funny because I actually wrote, I wrote a blog post a long time ago called the sponge factor. And I said like the number one thing that I actually look for in candidates is that they have the ability to learn and grow. Because if I feel you're like, Hey, look, I know what I'm doing. I've been here for a long time. And I, and it's like, so like, are you, is this it? Like, this is, this is the plateau or, or like, are you willing to do this? And we would have, like, I'd have some really good conversations in these interview process where it was almost like a challenge. Cause I wanted to see how people reacted to like me being challenged in their thoughts. Would they just agree with what I said? Or would they like, 
you know, like listen to some of the things where we have a back and forth because I actually didn't want to hire somebody uh, on my staff, you know, when I was a principal, that wouldn't actually make me better. That wouldn't actually add. I'm not, I'm not looking for a bunch of people who just listen to what I do. Yeah. I'm looking for people that want to do what's best for kids. And that doesn't mean agreeing with everything I say. That's not doing best for kids. That's just, you know, being easy, right? So I, I think that's a really good focus. So Matt, hey, I, I really appreciated you taking the time out of your day. I know you got some other things that you got to connect with. Um, and people, if you're listening right now, th th check out the Amplify Learning Series. Uh, there, It is linked down below. Uh, we're going to link down to Matt's blog. I'm going to share that tweet that uh, we also talked about. But Matt, thanks so much for your time. It, it's great to sit down and chat with you again. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, George. I appreciate it. I mean, a lot of things that we talked about today, you know, your, your inspiration and, you know, definitely support, uh, you know, everything that you're doing. And, I, and I'm really grateful and appreciative that you did the work that you did. So. Thanks, 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 man. And hey, thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you have a, a wonderful day. Take care.